Hi there, welcome to Tom Meets Interesting People. This is the podcast where I interview everyone from voice actors to nuclear engineers to talk about their work, their projects and their processes. And as we go into 2023, or at this point, I've got an hour and 18 minutes left of 2022, you'll see that I am changing up the format of this podcast just ever so slightly. I'm changing the way that I begin my intros, recording them after the fact, instead of right there, sort of in person and making a complete fool of myself, which I normally do. My guest today is Matthew Bliss, who is the host of the Dead Drop podcast, which is a podcast for gaming news across the industry in under 10 minutes. And in this mega interview, we talk about podcast editing, the art of podcasting, and deep dive into some of the equipment that we use as well. So if you're looking to start your own podcast, or if you kind of just want to know what we do, this is the episode for you. So sit down and enjoy this mega, mega interview. I think I want to kick off by talking about the Dead Drop podcast. Can you introduce the podcast to us? Tell us how it came about. Yeah, well, I've been doing podcasting for probably a year and a half now, actually. Um, and I've started and subsequently killed a few podcasts in my time. Most of them have been with other people. Yeah. So I'll have, you know, my cousin or some mates or uh people from the us usually because time zones it somehow lines up with australia a little bit better uh and the one thing that i found was that trying to organize doing a podcast with other people was one of the biggest obstacles to yeah. getting an episode done you know because you you need them to be available you need to have the subject matter you need them to have researched or read what you're going to be talking about and it just became incredibly hard. Now, I didn't drop podcasts for that reason. They just kind of ethereally disappeared for whatever reason. Yeah. But I found myself with some space and I wanted to do something with video games that was a bit different. Like I wanted to niche down a bit, but I was also very aware that I didn't want it to be something that occupied too much of my time. And there are so many video games podcasts out there that are three mates who sit down for three hours, talk about every news item, every video game they've played. They have a laugh, they have banter, some do it well, some don't do it as well as others. Uh, but I didn't have the time or probably the wherewithal to create a solo podcast by myself for three hours talking about absolutely everything to do with video games. It wasn't going to happen. So... Uh, I did a bit of research and I found out that there isn't many podcasts that are short that give you video game news. It's always yeah. an, a jumping off point or a, a, you know, a discussion point into whatever the person who's asked about it wants to talk about for the next 20 minutes. Uh, and the other thing I noticed about a lot of game news after reading them for articles for the last 10 years is that a lot of them contain fluff. So mm -hmm. no matter where you're getting your game news, it's always got stuff in it you either don't need or that they're trying to pad out so they've got SEO for marketing purposes and, you know, all the rest of that. Mm. So the idea for the dead drop was to make something short, digestible. The, the original design for it was going to be uh, a daily, so probably would have been five days a week. Definitely not sustainable for me. I started with three and ended up doing twice a week on yeah. a Monday and Thursday, which was is definitely doable. Um, but yeah, 10 minutes, twice a week, video game news, no fluff, a little bit of personality from me on either end, sometimes some opinions or uh, some analysis from me. More than usually, I try to use these opportunities in the episodes to unpack what is... Uh, can, we, can we swear on this podcast? Yeah, of course, go for it, go for it unpack the stuff that is like bullshit 
yeah. essentially. Because <laughs> there's so many times where articles are, there's like one piece of information that comes out, but you get like five different articles from it. Yeah. Or there's something old that gets rehashed and they spin the story in a way that makes it sound like something different or something clickbaity. And some stories are just pure speculation. There's no information there at all. It's just someone's opinion. So I try to use the episodes when that comes up to explain that to, to my listeners as well. And it makes something a little bit more genuine about the podcast too. So it's just me, 10 minute episodes, video game news. And as far as I can tell, there's still no one doing it. So yeah. that's why I'm really keen to stick with it. That and the fact that it fits into my schedule and being able to, to edit other people's podcasts and and help with theirs it just it's it fits in really well you, you better stick with it because it's now in my feed or like all the time i made sure it's in every single feed that i've got and if you don't i will take a plane over to australia and i will make sure that you start it up again uh <laughs> if i'm looking for a producer i'll hit you up <laughs> <laughs> so something i wanted to ask you sort of about that is obviously with all the news in gaming uh you've got news stories coming out left right and center how do you filter out those stories? How do you pick the ones to present? Well, I must admit, after saying all that I did about clickbait and speculation and rumor, sometimes it does help to lean into that stuff a little bit yeah. because there are things that people want to know. And uh, sometimes they're a little bit ridiculous and I don't tend to avoid them just because they are ridiculous. Sometimes they are really handy to talk about or it's just good for a laugh, or something like that. But generally, I will stick to a few particular sourcing sites for the news. Uh, it's not your GameSpot or IGN or any of those. Uh, the ones that I've found most reputable, funnily enough, is Eurogamer, uh, Video Games Chronicle. I also use the Video Game News subreddit, or it's Video Gaming News. I can't remember. There's a ton of different subreddits that um, kind of curate and post stories for game news that, that people think are, are useful. So I, I scroll through that a little bit. Uh, and sometimes I'll just see things pop up on Twitter that are a little bit interesting. And at that point, it becomes about filtering for time and how much, how much I can actually reasonably say about what the story is, because I'm not going to pad something out just because it's interesting. You know, if it's, uh, I can't even pull a bad story out of my brain because I don't remember the ones that are bad. But, <laughs> you know, if it's a single line and it's something that you can just say in a sentence, then I probably wouldn't include it. Yeah. Although now I've kind of changed the format a little bit in the last few weeks where previously I did maybe six or seven big stories where I'd spend <clears throat> approximately 30 seconds to a minute on each because I've got a very, very short timeline. Uh, now I've done four or five big stories that I unpack where, where it's necessary and then do quick news headlines after that. And that's where I can put the shorter stories now that are just, yeah. you know, one sentence things, you need to know this thing, and then we can quickly move on. You don't need an analysis from me about this. Yeah. And that's actually allowed me to include more than just seven stories. Now I can do, I can unpack five and maybe do eight headlines after that. So I'm covering more and more news as, you know, the format grows. Yeah. I, I also imagine that process doesn't just stop after you've collected the stories and after you've read them. I imagine that process continues into the editing as well. Yeah, well, that's the funny thing. Um, I know that you'll probably want to ask about how I script the episodes at some point. Maybe. Are you looking at my notes? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, uh, look, anyone who listens to it probably thinks, wow, that's, that's pretty succinct. And like he says a lot there and, and gets, manages to fit a lot in. He must script that really well. But the dirty little secret there is that I don't script it. Mm -hmm. I do what the what the voice actors would call punch and roll, where I kind of read a bit of the story, I get a bit of a summary, but I don't script it. I yeah. just say it. You know, I, I regurgitate the information and I listen back to it. And if it has what I need, I'll keep it in. 
if it doesn't sound right or I've said something that doesn't make sense or sometimes I'll skip a word or replace it with another that makes absolutely no sense, then I'll just go back and edit it again and um, re-record. And, you know, it's, it's a simple process to go about it. It's maybe, I don't know, how do you feel about things being scripted or not scripted? I actually haven't asked anyone about this because they haven't asked me necessarily. You haven't yet either. I've just brought it up, but <laughs> uh, no, no, yeah. totally. Um, yeah, I don't mind a tiny bit of scripting. Um, like my background, part of my background is in journalism. Part of it was in radio journalism, so I did have scripts, and a lot of that was reading out content that was passed to me, um, and also creating my own stuff. So the script was really, really important because we have the facts. We got to get that absolutely right, and we are the first people, often, especially in radio, because radio could be incredibly quick as a form of journalism to uh, report on that story but for the podcast uh my i don't have a script i've got bullet points and notes but mm. i'm not forcing myself oh i need to talk about this thing first and this thing second i let it sort of flow um yeah and what, what, what's your what's your thought, thoughts on that well i think i think it's really hard to to get a casual tone if you're reading like e even if you're trying to add some sparkle to it while you're reading something, then it just makes it sound maybe not as genuine as mm -hmm. it possibly could, which is really important for an interview like we're doing right now because you want the conversation to go in different directions. And as the host, you don't want to have your set of questions and have those questions not follow on from what the person has just said because it'll be really stilted and yeah. not make too much sense. Um. But because of what I do in my full-time job, which is a lot of training, yeah, it's a method that I use for that too, even though there are important point points to get out in that training. And we need to teach things for outcomes so that people walk away understanding something. A lot of people doing that training will script everything and try to do it as read, especially when it's virtual, like we are now, yeah, because they can have the luxury of the script right there and they can just read it even though they've got a live audience i try to avoid that where i can too because it, it gets that that genuine voice to it mm. um so yeah i don't actually i don't script the dead drop anymore i did at the yeah. start just to get the practice in i think also like you mentioned their training and i have been in, in numerous lectures where they have literally put the entire all the words they're saying on the PowerPoint page. And like at that point, just send me an email. Just let me yeah. see the PowerPoint myself. Yeah. Or let me read it myself. And like the most engaging ones I found use the PowerPoint to supplement their message as opposed to yep. be their message, if that makes any degree of sense. Absolutely. Death by PowerPoint is something that is it's so common in the corporate world, it's ridiculous. Because the way mm. people look at it. They they think, oh well, I'll have to put this information in a document too, but that's more work. Yeah. So I'm just going to dump it all into a PowerPoint, and I'm going to talk to it, and all the information will be there. But after the actual meeting, after the presentation, uh, I can just give them that PowerPoint, and they've got everything they need. Yeah. But what that eventually means, if you're in a context like mine where you talk about technology and, um, you know, change and transition and stuff like that. The, the the font size is like size eight. You can't even zoom in on that stuff. It's just walls of text and massive, uh, you know, architectural diagrams for software stacks and stuff. And you just, it's not useful. The supplementary bit is the important bit. Thinking yeah. about where your audience is engaged and, uh, you know, having a massive picture there, like some guy pushing a boulder up a cliff. If they're looking at that PowerPoint and going, what the hell does that mean? But then they start listening to you and it makes sense. That's, that's when you're doing it right, I think. Sorry, that's a bit of a pain point for me that you've, you've hit a bit of a nerve because I see it so I, yeah. much. Yeah, are, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, can, we, can, we both agree, though. It's, it, yeah, it, it's, please don't kill us by PowerPoint. I have bad eyesight. Please don't put size eight 
text on your PowerPoint. I can't read it. I can't see it. Um, but we also sort of ended up just following a nice little tangent there, which um, a few um, just just before Christmas, um, fellow podcaster, the Manic Pixie Weirdo, uh, described as side quests. And I love it. So we just went on a side quest. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> now, back to your podcast. Um, something that you said in your notes that you sent over is one of the principles that you try to run the dead drop with is to sort of expose the speculative and the rumor mongering, if you will. So tell me, tell me all about kind of, tell me, tell me all about that and what you're, what you're doing to kind of combat that. In video game news, speculation is rife all the time because video game developers, they keep everything behind closed doors for good reason. Yeah. They don't want to share bits of a story that could ruin the game experience for people who are going to play them. Uh, there are components of the development process that they don't share because they're patented or proprietary or, you know, there's there's backroom deals that happen between game companies and platform holders and all that stuff. So what that essentially means is what we don't know we'll try to fill in with the facts or information that we think is accurate or contributing to what people should know about this stuff. And what eventuates at that point is the, the speculation component of that. Um, and rumors, they're massive too. I think something that's emerged over the last few years more so as well is the, the gamer versus the developer mm. kind of relationship. And God of War Ragnarok is a perfect example of this where uh, because of certain development restrictions, I'm sure we'll find out what those are as time goes on, the audience on Twitter who were desperate to have the game, the game was unfortunately delayed, so they wanted more and more and more. They started uh, messaging the development teams that were present on Twitter with lewd images and harassment and things like that, just because they're not getting the game that they want that these people are currently making, yeah. but they haven't finished. And the reason they delayed it is because they haven't finished, but they're not getting what they want. Like, yeah, it's, it's not a great thing. And I think I like to use the, the podcast as a platform to call that stuff out as well, hmm. because I, I like my audience, not just to be gamers, but people in the industry too, yeah. because we don't just talk about games coming out. It's also, um, game industry news like the big Activision Blizzard uh, unionization and all of the legal action taken against them. But there's also the stuff with Activision Blizzard being bought by Microsoft. Yeah. And there's a lot of speculation there too because they're currently in the EU actually uh, in their competition regulator research component, which seems to be much more stringent than it should probably be. But um, more recently there, there was also some speculation around someone who made a silly tweet that seemed yeah. to imply that there's a bit of bias towards PlayStation to continue making Call of Duty available on both consoles. And the head of Microsoft has had to come out and say, look, we're not trying to pull the game from this platform. There is no contract that, that can be made that will make this game available on every console forever. It's not yeah. a legal possibility to do that. Anyway, we're diving down a hole here. Um, no, go for it. Let's, let's keep going on the side quest. <laughs> the, um, the whole point of this stuff is to unpack it so it makes sense and not just the reporting as it stands. Yeah. So uh, media literacy is a massive thing at the moment, especially for the past two or three years. The, um, the doom scrolling component of things, the uh, confirmation bias, getting your informational algorithmic circles that don't go beyond your, what you would confirm as information, like having your little bubbles that you get information in. That's what I try to fight with this stuff. Yeah. So uh, when I talk about a story, I'll make sure to point out that you know, this is a thing that you need to think about 
as you think of this story. Yeah. Uh, one of the things is, hey, there was a single earnings call from CD Projekt Red about Cyberpunk and their upcoming Witcher projects. Uh, there's about 10 news stories on this thing, but it's all from one thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to condense that. I'm going to pack that into a single, uh, single component of this podcast for you so that you know exactly what it is. Hmm. Or Kotaku might have an article about, um, you know, purporting that the biggest acquisition in history has just happened. Uh, with no news about what it is, and in the byline of that article, which you don't see in the SEO or the previews, in the byline of that article it says, well, at least to date. And it turned out to be the acquisition of, I think it was Take-Two, um, and that was announced four or five months prior. And what they were actually reporting is that the acquisition had closed, that yeah. they'd done the due diligence, performed all the actions required in order to make the acquisition happen. So there was no actual news there. And um, that was actually one, one article I used to expose a speculative article, a rumor article, and a clickbait article in what I called the clickbait episode, which may yeah. have been a bit of clickbait, admittedly. It did quite well. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's, that's essentially what I do. I just, I read between the lines and make sure that the audience, that the, the listener knows exactly what, at least what I understand it to be in the article. And based on what you said earlier, being able to, having to report the news as it comes out and being factually accurate isn't something that I necessarily, ha <coughs> oh, excuse me, isn't something that I necessarily have to worry about, but I do. Yeah. I also have the, the luxury of analysis after the fact. So I, I do realize that's a, a big component of uh, why I can do what I do because I'm not the, I may be the source for people, but I can read a bunch of other sources and get a full, full understanding of what the story actually is mm -hmm. before I tackle it myself. Yeah. Um, so it is a bit of a luxury. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself a reporter in that sense. Uh, in many ways, sure. though, I think you probably are. You are taking this information, you're synthesizing it, and the only real difference between what I was doing in the past before I went to uni, before I, before I went into my current career, and what you're doing here is I'm using the primary sources, I'm straight there on the scene, but I'm involved in the whole thing. You've got secondary sources, but you, you're stepped back. You can take that almost kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? That bird's eye view of everything. Where I, where I was doing, I was just in the macro. Mm. The and micro, that's, that's really say, funny. Actually. It's really funny that you say that too, actually, because it's just reminded me of one bit that invariably isn't a problem, but that I've stopped pointing out is that most gaming media sites will cover the same stories all the time. Yeah. But whoever has is the primary source for that story isn't important enough. Sometimes they do say it in the article. So uh, Video Games Chronicle will say, Eurogamer reported this week, but then you go to the Eurogamer article and it says, Bloomberg reported this week on, and it can become a big chain of things depending on who found the source material first or who's lazy or um, you know, active enough to find where it actually was as a source, which sometimes you don't even know. Sometimes there are no sources for this stuff. Yeah. Um, but at, at the start, I wanted to point that out. I wanted to, every time it would come up, I would say, okay, so Video Games Chronicle has reported this, but it was actually Bloomberg that came up with this information, which the journalist in you is probably saying, well, why wouldn't you just go to the source material? Um, Essentially, the information was the same regardless of where you go. So mm. uh, I've, I've stepped back from saying where the information came from, at least in terms of the, the service that I use. But that's why I post the links to the articles in my show notes whenever yeah. I talk about them. So that there is something there that if someone wanted to know a little bit more, they could click it and read the full article that I used as as my primary source for the info. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So the the whole chain effect of media uh, companies feeding off each other to get news articles that's that's sometimes something that you have to keep an eye on. Yeah, and th- the annoying thing is they're kind of on the cusp of of something great with that. Um, and you might be like, why, why are you saying that? And um, the reason why is because there is something to be said for fact checking your fellow researcher and your fellow journalist. And that's a good thing to do. We should all be checking and cross referencing kind of each other's work. And you can easily see like over here. In, I don't know what, what, what the media, media landscape is like over in, over in Australia, but over here you can see you know which which publications have the obvious left wing which one are on the, on the obvious right and you can kind of have both call each other out and then look at both areas of uh, both both publications and mm. kind of find i don't want to say the truth because that's really really a harsh word but but find what's closer to what's actually happening in there. yeah it's like the the cross section of the Venn diagram, there are these things the same in both, so yeah. there must be something there, and even if there's not, it'll help you find where the truth is. Mm-hmm. And that brings us on to, I think, um, something that you're very passionate about that you've been doing in your work as well, and that is media literacy. And you're, I, I, I get the sense you have a passion for like communicating that and teaching that to other people. Is that right? Yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, I found a lot when I've read articles, even before I did the dead drop, is that some of it just, it's, as I've said already, some of it just isn't news. Some of it is just nonsense for nonsense's sake. And reading a bit more than just what the headline is, is part of the important part of that, right? Media literacy is understanding the context of everything that you're reading, how it contributes yeah. to the broader context of uh, like a, an established narrative or whatever it might be, not just taking the thing at face value and then shuffling on. The whole headline reading thing, look, I do it. I do it sometimes. We're not all immune. Um, part of it kind of emerged as a result of the pandemic as well, really, yeah. because uh, sometimes the news just isn't great at reporting things as they are. Yeah. And look, th- we don't need to go into that. That can be yeah, yeah. <laughs> a side quest for a bonus episode maybe. Um, but um, yeah, it just became so obvious during the pandemic for some reason. Like sensationalist journalism became something that was more important than the information that was contained in it. Yeah, And being fair to journalism proper, I think gaming has had this for a long time, probably since Gamergate, actually. It's probably been more sensationalist after that point. And um, I, I want to, with anything that I do, whether it be training, telling someone how to use a particular piece of technology, anything, my goal is always to make my job redundant. Mm-hmm. That, that means that I am giving the people what they need to fish themselves. They don't need to buy the fish from me. So with this podcast, I'm trying to give people little, little pepperings of the skills that they need to dissect the articles the same way that I do. Not, you know, upfront and tacitly. Like sometimes I'll, I'll take an article aside and say, hey guys, this is one of those things that you need to look into a little bit more and think about, okay, this is rumor. They're saying they're using words like should or maybe or mm. could. And those are words that mean that they maybe don't have the information or they're filling the gaps in themselves. And it's not, it, it's potentially not the truth. It's a speculative yeah. look at what is going on. Mm. And if people listen to my podcast, and they hear those things and they start to see that stuff in the articles that they read and they find that they don't need me or my podcast anymore, then that is perfectly fine with me. Mm-hmm. If 
I'm hoping they they would enjoy themselves anyway and just hang around for you know a lark every for ten minutes every couple of days. But um, that that's part of what it is. Now, admittedly, it is a secondary principle of the show. Video game news is the primary one, so delivering that is the most important thing. Not every episode has a little tidbit of media literacy content in there, but making sure that I I keep that in there and make sure that they understand what I'm picking up from the news articles yeah. that I pick. That's an important thing to me. Yeah. Because yeah. I think it's also important to sort of talk about that and recognize that um, as humans, we are going to have a natural kind of unconscious bias. We can't help it. That's just how we're made. Um, but recognizing what that bias is and then saying, okay, this is me now trying to combat that. That is definitely something that um, I think more people kind of need to do. And you mentioned there as well, um, giving something for people to take away. And you already talked about uh, those kind of could have, should have words. Uh, those words that sort of say, we don't really have the whole story. So is there anything else you could tell maybe my viewers here, my listeners rather, tell my listeners, um, we are not on video. You are not going to see my face. No one is seeing this. Uh, <laughs> one day, one day we'll get you on, get you on TV maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know. I'll be on a paper, I'll be in a paper bag. Um, is there <laughs> anything you can give to, uh, g give out kind of now as kind of like something really simple to just, just keep an eye on and to kind of just improve everyone's media literacy just a tiny bit. It's a big one. Um, like for media literacy in general, I would probably say it's okay to revise what you read. Mm -hmm. So media curation is a, a boon if you can find a place that's reliable enough. Um, Reddit can be one of those places as long as you are quite diligent with how you, you know, articulate the sources. But in general, I would think picking a few publications that you know speak to you in a way that gives you what you need without mm. confirming that bias, without, um, you know, feeding that unconscious nature to just go for the hit headline kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think that's an important thing. Now, in video games, I would say for myself, avoid Kotaku. Uh, maybe avoid some of the smaller indie ones. Now, that's not to say that they're bad. Generally, they will use sources from the bigger ones, which is a bit of a, another media problem that maybe we could unpack in another episode because yeah. there's actually been a lot of video game media companies that have been closing down because of uh, the economy in the US, which is really unfortunate. Um, yeah, picking picking a few that you you know you can rely on, or at the very least give you what you need to make an adequate decision. In video games, I would pick, as I said, Video Games Chronicle, Eurogamer, um, GamesIndustry.biz. You know, sixty six percent of what I just said was based in the UK, so that might tell you something. Um, and making sure that you've, you've always got, you're always stepping back a little bit and whatever you read, look for those words, pull out the information and then evaluate that information against maybe what even brought you there. Yeah. Like if you looked at a headline that said McDonald's is killing people, then you read the article and you note that. Uh, someone unfortunately died in a restaurant of a cardiac arrest and it was, McDonald's was not responsible, then you might think, oh, okay, this is probably a bit sensationalist. You know, he might have had a French fry before he, you know, arrested in the restaurant. It's not McDonald's' fault. McDonald's yeah. isn't killing people. They might mention, you know, the old story of the woman dropping hot coffee on her lap yeah. and using that as a propaganda story for to discredit her for her lawsuit and things like that. Uh, yeah, it, it's, look, it's a little bit hard to say because every time you land on one way to get around this stuff, they find another way to, to bait you into 
clicking those links and getting into their websites. But that's that's the other component too. Sometimes the structure of those web pages should give you an idea of what type of publication it is too. Yeah. Like if you're if you're looking at 10 new ways to address your well-being and you go onto the first page and it gives you an introduction and then it says click next to move on to the the first tip and then click next again and then you get the second yep I can see our hosts <laughs> Tom's face here is uh, perfectly illustrating exactly the point I'm trying to make um, that kind of like SEO I don't think it's backlinking but it's similar like you you want that activity and that traffic and uh, it's a clickbait title that people want to find more about. They'll feel like they'll get a bit of FOMO if they don't read it. So they will definitely click it. And that clicking will get them ad revenue and it will boost their numbers for interactions with the website for them to sell more ads and all that kind of garbage. And luckily, that stuff doesn't happen so much anymore for video games unless it's a ranking kind of thing, which is actually fairly common in video games still top 100 rpgs of all time and stuff like that but yeah that's, yeah um, there's definitely a line for those sort of slide shows i think as i call them mm. uh kind kind of kind of publications like i can get it for doing a ranking thing like you want to like e even though let's say the official charts is now kind of in music is kind of redundant at this point because we've got so many different places you can consume music and that you can see what the chart is just by Googling it. Um, it'll take me 10 seconds to find out what's number one in the UK. There is something to be said for that little bit of a frill to kind of go from 10 to nine to eight and just to focus be on each individual one. But when it is for a piece of journalism that's meant to be serious, and then it's treated like this kind of click here to read more. Like, mm. no, don't like that. And look, tech is bad for it. They, a lot of companies, I think CNET is one of those companies, uh, will often have their phone and technology reviews organized by, like, it'll be a massive review with, like, pages and pages of stuff. Uh, they'll organize it by the build and design. The yeah battery life, the software, uh, the connections and, you know, the accessories. And those will be paginated as well, which makes sense kind of because yeah. you, you'll get what you need and you'll leave. But, you know, it's okay to look at that, how that's done and still go ahead as long as you've made the decision that you, you definitely want the information. You're not just doing it because you feel like you have to throw yourself across the bow of, you know, ads and cookies and, and SEO and things like that just to get at stuff so you can evaluate the information. Mm. Yeah. More often than not, I'd say nine times out of 10, if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So something else that came up in the notes that you sent over, um, you, you sort of described it as the art of podcasting. And as we kind of alluded at there, podcasting is you, you, you've obviously got the bit where you are researching and then you are creating the content and then you have the editing. So tell me a bit about your philosophy of podcasting and tell me a bit about why you described it as the art of podcasting. Well, look, it's interesting. I probably use that as quite a, a throwaway phrase, I think. But it, for any podcasters listening, they can probably commiserate with both yours and my experience with, you know, putting podcasts together, uh, none more so than listening to your season one uh, kind of wrap up, where I could, I could hear in that episode, you, you've been caught by the bug. You've like, yeah, <laughs> you felt where podcasting is going. You're enjoying the medium. And now it's time to explore all the things, whether that's uh, the technology, the, the software, the different ways that you can manipulate the episodes in terms of design and structure, uh, you know, changing the music or changing your tone, investigating uh, the plugins, which is a component that not too many podcasters explore perhaps, but um, 
that's a way that you can add an extra level of, of, uh, dare I say, professionalism, you know, it cleans up the audio a little bit, maybe add something extra as you're doing that stuff. All of that, I think, comes together as an art form for podcasting itself. And every podcaster is put on that journey. Um, the only thing I didn't say there is the content, which I think is, is an argument that happens a lot with podcasters. What's more important, the content or the quality? of the episodes that you create. And they're both important, but everyone will pay attention to them in varying degrees. Uh, unfortunately for me, I try to pay attention to both. And that's probably why my journey has been so long so far. And why the dead drop is the way it is too. Mm. Because while I look, Let's summarize my starting experience with podcasting being the Blue Yeti journey, which mm. a lot of people start on, right? We know Blue is a company that creates microphones that are affordable, and affordable these days needs to be in sneer quotes because it's not as affordable as a lot of other great options. Um, but it's also a great place to start because you learn a lot. You start at the very bottom, you yeah. crank that gain all the way up, and immediately you learn about reverb that you need to treat your room. Uh, you know, all these things that, that make the audio sound terrible just because the Blue Yeti is what it is. Hmm. But you're also editing through software and you start to try to fix these things in post, which, you know, every experienced podcaster will say, if you put crap in, you're going to get crap out. Yeah. So, yeah. Do your pre-production, don't do post-production. Um, but having to do that post-production introduces you to things like D-reverb, you know, D-noise, all these plugins that allow you to uh, manipulate your sound and affect it and change things, you know, dynamic gating and uh, compression and all those things. And getting introduced to those with an experience like the Blue Yeti is a really good way to to go about yeah. it yeah uh kind of like mixing your colors when you're about to do a painting i don't know I'm trying to get somewhere close to art there no i totally um, get it though. i totally get it yeah and and you develop a style as you investigate these things too some people are tech oriented and they'll say okay i need a better microphone to be able to uh you know investigate the kind of stuff that can improve my voice a little bit and that is a hole that you can dive down forever. There is no bottom to that microphone hole. Um, and some people will think about it and go, okay, this is, I'm okay with this sound as long as what I'm saying is compelling enough for the, the person listening, then it's going to be okay. Yeah. And I think that's where podcasting as an art form comes from. It's you're creating a product that you put out there and you've made it as an intentional product for yourself. It's your, it's your baby. It's your yeah. experience that you're creating for other people. And if you're happy with it and putting it out there, obviously with a desire to improve all the time, then that is a piece of you out there as well. Yeah. And I think that that's probably where the art comes from. Mm -hmm. And look, there's debate all over the shop. You know, you can find anybody and have a debate with them. What is a podcast? Uh, what is the best microphone? USB versus XLR microphones. Um, what DAW do you use? Which, which audio editor do you use? Oh, no, Adobe, that's too expensive. Oh, but Reaper has so many different plugins and ways to automate your processes. Oh, but Audacity is free and it's, it's getting better. Uh, you know, content versus quality. All these arguments happen on the internet all the time. Podcasts. Oh, yeah have them constantly yeah uh, but for me being a part of both being a bit of a tech head and wanting to explore a lot of these things and having an interest to always try something new trying to solve a problem sometimes that isn't there it means that the stuff that i make is constantly changing as well yeah um so my approach at this stage i haven't I haven't actually had a proper opportunity to uh, 
practice what I've learned with the dead drop over the last few months in an old in an interview set up like this before. Um, there are a few that I have edited for with my my side hustle that I try to use the skills that I've acquired to to fix up, but there's only so much you can do as an editor. But me as a podcaster myself, being interested in both sides and just trying to get the best content for the people listening. Yeah. That, that's where the art truly comes from, I think. Yeah, like you said, yeah, I caught the bug and then I was like, actually, this is the kind of thing I want to do because I do have a weak spot for those sort of long form interviews. Um, when I get to the questionnaire, I'm going to reference one of my heroes, James Lipton. Um, from inside the actor's studio his interviews were legendarily long like i think one went for about 12 hours and i was like mm -hmm. i could do an hour <laughs> 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 um but yeah it is very much like it is very much sort of like an art now that you put it out like uh, in that context it kind of makes sense now you say it and that's kind of what i was a little bit confused about i was like but it's it's more of a I was like, I'm treating it like a science. I do this thing and then I get it. But then you also mentioned it's kind of like painting. And I realized, especially sort of like when I'm in my post-production, when I'm editing um, in Audacity, because it's free and actually it's pretty decent. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's <laughs> I got pretty it well. It's, yeah. yeah, I got it because it's free and I'm skint. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. like you get, you do end up kind of getting a sense of, oh, I know if I cut it here, and if I silence this bit, and if I maybe truncate that and bring it a little bit closer, yeah, I know that's that's kind of gonna going to work. Yeah, I don't necessarily write all that down and then repeat it like I'm following a kind of scientific method. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and look, some people might be video podcasters, some might be audio only. For my format, doing punch and roll, it would look like those old vlog videos that the kids used to do where there's hard cuts every couple of seconds and look way too jittery. <laughs> um, your ears are the most important thing because mm -hmm. people don't have a problem. And the science will say this. People don't have a problem with jittery video. Yeah. The video could be, you know, 260p. Barely matters. What needs to be right is the audio. Yeah. Because that, if you've got bad audio, people are going to switch off. Yeah. Now, when I say bad audio, I mean things that cannot be negotiated, like, um, you know, crackling, like excessive background noise. If the file is corrupted in a way and it kind of cuts in and out and, you know, that kind of thing. There are non-negotiables with the audio, but getting the audio just right or right enough, you can see, you can kind of hear, and I hear myself putting the science and stipulations on top of what is a medium that you know people establish for themselves you know mm. and i definitely don't want to gatekeep that stuff but uh the point is your ears become the most important thing when you're doing edits but while your ear doesn't physiologically change as you listen to more episodes it does get more attuned yeah. you do start to hear more things which is both a good thing and a bad thing like for me uh i am brilliant at removing breaths and uh you know finding mouth mouth clicks and hearing all the bad things that we need to get rid of teach me your ways teach me your ways the, <laughs> well here's the problem i hear them in real life now and i had to sit through a meeting yesterday for my day job where for my workplace they distribute headphones that have a microphone that sits way too close to the mouth. Mm. And every person who using a USB headset like that can't hear themselves as they talk. They always position the microphone directly in front of their face. Yeah. And all my podcasters listening will know you get that right in front of your mouth and you do a bit of a breath, you get a little plosive. Yeah. And you know, Dare I do an example that you can edit out later or avoid? I don't know. <laughs> it depends I, on how automated. I, I feel like it's, yeah, we've, we're plosive. It's like we want to avoid these because these are some of the most unpleasant sounds. 
and you, you, you invariably yeah. can't fix them. Yeah. Like I've I've investigated the Isotope RX10 deplosive plugin tool, and all it does is reduce the level of the volume. It might do something a little bit different, but it just reduces the volume. So now that's all I do. When I see a yeah. plosive and it can't be deleted because it must be included for the sentence to make sense, I just shoop, level it down. The plosive is a little bit less, um, a little bit less prominent. You know, it doesn't pop the headphones when someone's listening to it right close to their eardrum, which is sometimes the worst thing. Yeah. Um, like if you imagine someone blowing into your ear, that's terrible. Um, and probably just for context for anyone listening who doesn't know what a plosive is, it's when you make those harsh P sounds or B sounds or, you know, there's a sharp gust of air that comes out of your mouth. And if that goes directly into the microphone, that's when you get the sounds that we're talking about. I just, I hate them so much. But um, yeah. point is in these, in these meetings that I'm in, so many people position the microphone so close that as they're talking, I'm like listening to it and I'm, I'm wincing, trying not to visibly wince because I don't want to put them off, but I'm like dissecting, I'm, I'm, I'm doing audio editing in real life. I'm yeah. trying to pull the content away from the plosives, which is a lot of work. It means the meetings are incredibly fatiguing for me. But the, the thing is, I look around at other people in the meeting and I'm like, you guys aren't reacting to this. Yeah. And you're the boss and you're not telling this person that they can just move their microphone, someone with the most authority in the meeting. And I even put it out as a chat message to my team members. I said, here's an example of what plosives are like. Do you hear these? And is this really annoying? And all of them said no. And that's because when you edit audio, you become so attuned to the things that you want to remove, you start hearing them in real life. Yeah, yeah. And that is a bit of a problem <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. If, if you just want to sit there and enjoy things, it's great if it's a film because they will always remove that stuff. But if you're just having a conversation with your mate and they're a little bit dehydrated and you know they love preempting their sentence with a big lip smack to punctuate it, and you're like, oh, I'd remove that. I'd remove that. Yeah. yeah. Gets a bit yeah. bad. <laughs> did, did you also find when you were going through them in the early days that you you were saying uh and ah uh, like a lot at the start of your sentences? Uh, no. There you go. You got one. Um, hey. <laughs> and there's another one. <laughs> I, I found that I say and and so a lot. Yeah. But that's to take the time to think, yeah. even though conjunctions are just as bad as, you know, unusual noises like R and um, uh, I did notice that and I still do it today. Uh, I think I probably do it less than most because a lot of my talking in front of people is performative. Mm -hmm. So I tend to be pretty good at constructing what I say before I get to the point of saying it. And at that point, you know, you can kind of avoid it. But I've also gotten used to using silence quite a lot when I deliver things because, yeah. uh, you know, I've done teacher training, uh, so I could be a secondary teacher. Silence is important there too, but adults always underestimate silence as a valuable tool hmm. for, you know, adult learning. Yeah. Uh, I even had a conversation with someone yesterday where I said, you know, a bit of silence really helps because it captures their attention. They kind of lean in because they're not hearing anything yet. But it um, doesn't work for podcasts because if you have silence, they either skip it or they think there's something wrong with the file and there's a problem. So yeah. Not something you can do all the time. Maybe with video, yeah. but... Maybe, maybe, yeah. It is something also because I did my degree in psychology and part of that was getting qualitative data and interviews and... One of the things that I found really, really helpful was giving that silence just about maybe five seconds or so, five, six seconds. That gives people, people have two reactions, time to think and panic. And people will then be like, oh, oh, oh God, I need to fill more space. 
And it's a wonderfully manipulative tool that I have employed in many interviews, and I'm not going to admit that out loud. So I'm going to edit that bit. No, I'm not going to edit that bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, silence yeah. is uh, is is a great tool. But you also mentioned as well, um, hearing those things in real life. I had a meeting uh, earlier this morning uh, with my former dissertation supervisor and a few other people. And I know I've been committing a little bit of a cardinal sin by having a very loud bottle next to me during this interview that I will be editing out. Um, but like I heard the bottle that she was using and I heard all of her mouth movements and I heard all of those little things that she was doing. And then I heard her move away from the microphone and I was like, I can't explain all of this. <laughs> yeah you're like it's terrible i just i don't i i can't but also i can't un, i can't do anything about it all i can do is sit here and listen to it <laughs> yeah it's like it's, it's like annoying. a curse isn't it it's almost that it's almost the podcast a curse now that is precisely why i said it's a good and a bad thing like yeah. i will i don't know if it'll go away if i stop doing podcasting but i will forever be walking around hearing all those mouth clicks and plosives and be yeah. desperate to to make changes and you know what part of the reason i started the side hustle of uh editing other people's podcasts and helping other people build their own is that i would hear it in other people's podcasts too yeah not to presume upon anything particular but and and look it comes from a, a bit of a pretentious position too you want to do what sounds good for you, knowing that you can do it to help someone else. But at the same time, someone else's podcast is their, their art, so they have built it intentionally that way sometimes as well. Like breaths is probably something for much debate. Some people, as they talk, they will talk for a little bit and then <gasps> they will do a little breath. Sometimes they're bad. Sometimes it's okay to include them because it sets the pace for what someone is saying. More commonly, breaths will be removed from podcasts, but sometimes people make the intentional choice to include them. Yeah. So you kind of have to be careful when you approach people about the thing that they create, a thing that you think might be bad, but they've actually done that intentionally because they prefer it. Yeah. And adding on to that as well, sometimes a perfectly placed um or ah uh, or just a thinking moment like you said earlier on, makes that sentence actually make sense. Yes. And more thoughtful. Absolutely. There is, there is the room for a tactful um every so mm -hmm. often. And I, that's why my, the way that I edit is really important to me. Like I will always listen to the entirety of the episode and I will do uh, all the editing as I listen. Yeah. And if the context calls for a longer gap or a bit of an um or an R or an end or you know, whatever conjunctive phrase they use to, to give themselves thinking time and it tells the listener effectively that there is thinking time happening there or giving them time to, to digest the information, as you said, then definitely keep it in. But there are some people out there who have videos about how to hack the edit and edit two hours of podcasts in three minutes because essentially you just delete the silence, keep the front and end where it may have chopped it off and then you've got a podcast, but it's, it's not as intentional as it should be. Maybe, maybe the editing is now part of my art form as, yeah. as well as the podcast itself. <laughs> and I'm definitely guilty of hitting that truncate button a little bit too liberally. Uh <laughs> I'll look, I'll, let me tell you, the one thing that changed my life, and I, I should say I use Adobe Audition to mm. edit my stuff just because that's what I started with. The ripple delete or shuffle delete function, especially for interviews, is a life changer. Yeah. It really is. I'm not sure if Audacity has that as well, but the ability it's to remove silence, but shuffle up the entire play space, keep the files in sync, and being able to just move on saves so much time. Yeah, it's, it's a tad more manually. Man, man, it's a tad more manual uh in audacity but yeah no i kind of i kind of do the thing manually as i'm going sort of through it anyway 
And the truncate function does sort of do that, but it also runs the risk of having, let's say, somebody's normal sentence and just having a normal pause. It does run the risk of making it sound like one long, continual, unforgiving sentence that never, ever, ever stops. So you have yep. to be very, very careful with that. And we we just been now we've been dancing around talking about editing. Um, so tell me tell me tell me all about Blissery. The first thing you probably wonder is the name. Uh, it's actually a combination of my wife's and my last names. So the end of her name has E R Y at the end. Mm-hmm. Mine is Bliss. Just made sense to shove those together because um we're actually going to do a podcast soon because I intend to move to Ireland for a little bit because my wife is yep. Irish. Um. We're going to do a podcast about that, which kind of tackles a bit of a niche yeah. about people moving from Australia uh, to another country. We'll be talking about Ireland for our experience. But funnily enough, there are plenty of podcasts out there about Irish people who got married in Australia moving back to Ireland, but nothing about uh, Australian people moving over there with Irish uh spouses so it's yeah that, that, that's a bit of our niche we're going to see if we can tackle that mm-hmm. but yeah blissery.fm uh it's i've been wanting to try and use what i've learned through my podcasting journey to help other people with their podcasts because that's my prime directive in most things if i know something and i have the capacity to tell someone else what that thing is then i really want to be able to help other people do what I have done and, you know, potentially truncate that, that work that took me a year and a half into Mm. two months or even a month or even just, you know, a couple of hours of conversation. And it's really funny being embroiled in podcasting for long enough. You presume a lot of knowledge about podcast development on other people, and it's actually not that well known. That's why there is such a, a huge influencer uh not market but there are a lot of people with the capacity to influence new podcasters because yeah there's so much to learn and not everybody knows this inherently even though it feels like they should because why wouldn't you because i do that kind of thing so the base level of my service is editing i will edit people's podcasts generally it's interview and um solo work uh, I haven't tried to tackle the audio drama yet, although I am getting a bit playful with one of my clients, um, Podcast Assemble. It's two people in Sydney. One bloke's English and one is American, actually, though they're set in Australia. Um, they talk, do video game, uh, not video game, they do movie reviews and will do old ones and brand new ones. But I find that because of the banter that they have, I'm doing little uh, little skits into their show, which they mm-hmm. haven't had the capacity to edit themselves. So, you know, one one person will proclaim something loudly. So I just pump a bit of reverb in there and <laughs> um, make it sound like they're they're shouting it from a mountaintop into a valley or something like that. Um, yeah. yeah. Or there's like uh, there was one skit that I did where one of them literally said. Uh, do it in movie voice. And I got that, um, you know, trailer theme in the background while they were doing in a world with blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so I haven't done the audio, audio drama yet. I would like to tackle it one day. Mm-hmm. But editing is the prime thing. Uh, I've done a course with a previous podcasting pundit, Tanner Campbell, to be able to learn how to master the audio well. You know, using compression effectively, assembling your plugins well, making sure you're getting the best sound out of manipulating the audio, not just cutting and removing silence and shoving things together. It's it's all in the EQ and all that stuff to make you sound the best that you possibly could. But what I found is most of the stuff that I do now is that I mention I have a podcast editing business and they say, Oh, I'd love to start a podcast. And so I sit down with them for maybe an hour or half an hour and tell them everything I know or that they'd like to know about uh, doing a podcast. So while I'm currently actively editing 
two podcasts. I have, by extension of telling people I do this, I think I've started five podcasts with other people nice. <laughs> just by, you know, giving them some information and then them saying, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. So I think I'll probably fold some consultation service in there to some degree. At the moment, it's not paid if, you know, I'm staring at the camera, but uh, if you listening would like to get in touch, I can be contacted at info at blissery.fm. That's the email. And um, yeah, it's just yeah. so far it's, it's manageable. Um, I feel like it'll get to a point where I need to say, no, I can't take any on, on any more clients. But I am hoping it's one of those things that I can, you know, say, hey, my full-time job is now becoming my part-time job because I can do this for a living. Yeah. We'll and see. I do wish you all success with it. And I do sincerely hope, it sounds cruel, but I hope you reach that point where you have to turn <laughs> people away. Um, and yeah. and you, you get there and you turn it into your full-time job because this is a really epic field um to be in and i've always been kind of curious about like sort of podcast consultation and podcast sort of coaching because i'm just seeing that world on the outside looking in i've got i i know i've got no interest in doing it myself but i've always been kind of curious about what it's like to actually do that and it's from a desire to to share what you know and find like-minded people too mm -hmm. because there are a lot of people out there that you know as a podcaster who don't care that you're a podcaster yeah um or they may not understand what that means like both my parents are teachers and i had a have a podcast that's currently on hiatus the teaching culture cast which was designed to be pointed at people who are learning to be teachers mm give them a shared experience from an interview with a teacher from varying aspects of, of doing teaching and getting into the teaching world, uh, you think, perfect, you know, parents of teachers, they'd be all over that. Mm -hmm. Not really. <laughs> they were kind of like, oh, podcast. Hmm. How, how, do you, how do you get a podcast? And, you know, it just kind of devolved from there. But finding your audience is sometimes hard but when they find it and they listen to it and they hang around mm. those are the people you want to direct it to yeah. where it's possible yeah um there's seven people who always download my episode within the first couple of hours of being released and i i see you i i know you're there you're on the stats uh come say hi on twitter or i hope or if twitter is still up at this point i don't know what's going on um, but yeah. yeah, trying to explain like kind of how to start a podcast is I I used to kind of a few a few weeks ago even just up to up to that point I was saying oh just Google it you can just go Google I had a friend actually literally asked me oh how how did you start it I was like I I just kind of did but then I realized I had all of that experience from being a journalist beforehand and yes. doing interviews as part of my psychology research so i had that already come in and so the stepping stone for me was literally just a nice little skip but mm -hmm. to somebody who's brand new show them audacity if they've never done audio work even if it is the simplest one and you, you'll just see somebody get confused and somebody have just no idea what's going on yeah but the the tech side the software side, that is more than usually the easiest part to mm. just Google. Yeah. Because someone, actually, no, that's, that's wrong. 10,000 people somewhere have each done a video about how the particular software that you've selected works and how you can do it effectively for yourself. The thing that they can't teach you, I've discovered, is... The thing that trains you to be the podcaster that you're going to be. Yeah. And I mentioned my ear before being trained to the point of wanting to edit my real life. That is a bit the biggest part that I struggled with and that I had to pay for a course to do the, the equalization of 
audio because every every man and his dog can tell you <clears throat> can tell you that doing a parametric equalizer is about frequencies. We have uh, our very low our very low frequencies down in the like a hundred hertz to the bottom end of the range, you know, zero to a hundred hertz. Then you've got your mid range at that point. Uh, it, it probably still is a bit muddy and bassy up to 250 hertz. And then you've got your mid range, which goes kind of up to six to 8,000 hertz. And then you've got your high frequency voice, which is kind of up here. And, you know, it's up in the sparkly end, but <clears throat> sorry, I can't do it. It's too early in the morning for me. Um, but yeah, they'll tell you all that stuff. And then all you've got to do is you've got to increase where you want the good stuff and decrease where you've got the bad stuff. And job done. That's your full tutorial. The thing that they don't tell you about EQ is what you're listening for, how to listen for what's good and what's bad. It's a pure quality, qualitative measure. And it's only through watching enough people use an EQ to fix a product that they've got or having someone, <clears throat> excuse me, having someone look at what you've done and say, yes, that's good. Mm. Or no, it's still a little bit muddy. Just, you know, pull that down a little bit in the 250 to 200 range. And that'll like, that'll demud that a little bit. That'll make it sound really good. Yeah. Um, that's the stuff that's missing. And I tell you what, you pointed out quite rightly there that Previous life experience does inform how your podcast works as well. For me, it's having done tech training and being a teacher means that I can explain things quite well and succinctly without much effort. And for you, it's, you know, doing an interview, unpacking and getting the information that you want without having to, uh, you know, hit the nail on the head. You're, you're definitely quietly doing it in the background, whereas someone has a sledgehammer trying to hammer the nail <laughs> to get what they need out there. You know, that, that kind of precision only comes with someone's personal experience. Mm. And I think that's where some of the advice can really come in handy. Having yeah. someone out there that has that experience to say stuff like that and also say that it's okay to not know it, yeah. but to let your journey unfold. I think that's where the successful you know, podcasting pundit really does their thing well. Mm. Um, and I'd like to be one of those one day, maybe. I think you are. You already are. Yeah. If, if you don't think you are, this is, this is proof. We, we're having a proffering in-depth discussion about like the, the, the art of podcasting. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. There you go. See, you don't even have to pursue it. Sometimes it just comes upon you and you're like, oh yeah, that's an opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, no, totally. And like, like you said there, yeah, um, I was influenced by journalism. I was then influenced by doing qualitative research. And I noticed that my qualitative research was influenced by my journalism. And then my podcast was in influenced by my, by my research. And if you were to look at my notes, you would be like, oh, yeah, that's a psychologist's notes. That, that's, how, that's how a qualitative researcher is laying out their schedule their question schedule um yeah you'd be you'd be totally um you 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 would see that as well so yeah we are uh, that, that's actually something i haven't even thought about properly so thank you for that you're welcome yeah so oh god i want to talk about equipment let's talk about equipment because we were chatting about equipment in our pre-interview chat thing we did and um we were lamenting about i think the one that everybody simultaneously loves and and maybe not everyone loves and hates, but like it's got its lovers, it's got its haters, and that's the Blue Yeti. And earlier on in our pre-chat, you had some thoughts about that, I believe. Yeah, look, the, the Blue Yeti, it's an interesting one. And it's one of those things where I don't agree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Yeah. It, it is a microphone. It is a USB microphone. It's, it records your voice. It does that job well. <laughs> the quality 
of that voice can sometimes, uh, you know, be variable. Uh, my experience starting out with the Blue Yeti, which if any podcasters listening are currently cringing and eye rolling, it's appropriate. Look, it's there's a point that you get to in your life where if you've used a Blue Yeti for long enough, you're like, okay, yeah, that's that's pro. I think I need to upgrade. But that being said, I, without the using the Blue Yeti as my first microphone, I wouldn't have honed my craft the way I did. Yeah, because it's kind of like uh, being put onto a bike. You know, maybe a professional cyclist's bike without training reels and having never ridden a bike before, you're going to fall over. You're going to have yeah. trouble sticking your feet with the pegs into the pedals. You're going to run into a few trees. But the more you do that running into trees, the more you learn about how not to do it and you yeah. get better at riding the bike. I think the Blue Yeti is very much that as a microphone. The, the scoffing that people do about as soon as you get a Yeti and that being the worst thing in the world. It's definitely not. It's a great training device because, uh, look, I've just said it's a great training device, but <laughs> I'm about to tell you all the things that are terrible with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> look, the Blue Yeti, the the overall design and build isn't great. It's a very heavy microphone. Um, sometimes the software has issues. Uh, it's It's really a condenser microphone, so it will pick up a lot of noise. It's multi-pattern. It can be omnidirectional and pick up in 360 degrees or cardioid with just a focus pattern, but invariably it will pick up noise from everywhere. And yep. the unilater unilaterally, the advice that I hear about the Blue Yeti is to turn the gain all the way down because that way you, you zero in on your own voice, getting close to it, and it removes as much background noise as possible, which admittedly can still be quite a bit. Uh, and positioning yourself on that microphone, really hard. But if you do all that stuff for the first time and hear it, you start to practice the way that you use a microphone better. You improve your microphone technique because you may have added a lot of heavy Ps, a lot of plosives into that microphone. So you position it off to the side or you see a YouTube video on mic technique and you start positioning the microphone differently. Uh, you get it into your audio editing software and you want to remove that reverb and you you saw that plugin called D reverb so you you know you try to build that down a little bit sounds terrible but the room isn't echoey anymore yeah um all that stuff that's that what is what I've used as a journey to get to the stage where I'm at to eventually earn an upgrade to something a little bit more professional uh, in the XLR space as opposed to a USB microphone which I definitely don't balk at. There are great USB microphones out there now. Um, and yeah, look, it, if I was advising people now, I try to have them avoid getting the Blue Yeti if they can. But at the same time, I appreciate it for the journey that it gave me. And if you want to hear yeah. the difference, you can dial into the dead drop. If you listen to, I think, the first 10 episodes, I did those with the Blue Yeti. Yeah. And I had really dialed in my craft at that point. I tried to make it so close to a microphone that wasn't a Blue Yeti that maybe you won't even be able to tell the difference. It can't be a blind test now because I've told you that that's what I used. But um, yeah, you know, dialing in your craft and taking advantage of what you got, that's the most important lesson that I think the Blue Yeti can teach you. And yeah. look, the snowball is cheaper. It's no better. Um, what I would recommend is Rode for anyone listening who would like to start a podcast. The Rode NT USB is just as much, if not less, than the Blue Yeti, and it sounds spectacular. I have edited episodes that use that for people who have used that microphone. Chef's kiss it yeah. sounds brilliant. I think it's even got EQ software that comes with it, which is really helpful. Um, but we're in a whole line of microphones now that are really trying to target gamers and streamers, and it's making 
better USB microphones and XLR microphones that are more accessible and broadcast ready. Yeah. So, and and broadcast ready, I mean, what I mean there is that they look good on camera yeah. somehow. Um, so that's a thing to watch out for too. But look, I could talk for ages about microphones yeah. because that's a hole that we've all dived down at some point. Some people pulled out quickly. I, I actually um, listened to a podcast uh, by Podcastage who does microphone reviews on YouTube. His podcast, Bandrew Says, is great because it talks about and tests the equipment. But there are so many different microphones out there that you can get fatigued if, it's, if technology isn't your thing. Trying yeah. to pick a microphone is probably one of the hardest decisions you'll make only because you make it hard for yourself. Whatever you've got will do the trick. That has yeah. to be the advice that you give people. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, be willing to spend a little bit of money if you want to do that. Yeah. And, and yeah, this is turning into a device thread already, which I'm sure you would have been leaning into. But <laughs> um, I would say don't, don't be turned away by USB either because yeah. it's coming a long way. and there are people out there who get on podcasts all the time and they use USB microphones. Ariel Nissenblatt, she uses yeah. a Shure MV7 using the USB. James Cridland with Pod News, pretty sure he's on a USB Shure MV7 as well. Um, yeah, some this of the podcast. best. This is a USB mic I'm talking to you on. There you go. And it sounds yeah. brilliant. It's so, a 14 year old USB mic, but it works. <laughs> it's boutique. You're in the antiquing <laughs> section of microphones, <laughs> which is truly a thing. And if, you, if you're interested to, to really unpack what a microphone can do, uh, Podcastage is great on YouTube for product recommendations and comparisons. But Booth Junkie, who is a voice actor, a, a voiceover artist, I should say, um, sharing his stuff on YouTube as well. He's done interviews lately, but he's talked a lot about microphones and mic technique and setting up your space usually for voiceover work, but it all carries over to podcasting as well. And his voice is just spectacular. You could sit yeah. there and, and listen to it constantly. It's great. Yeah, um, I'll go have to check those two out. But something I actually wanted to ask you, and I think we alluded at in our pre-chat as well, is am I right in thinking that there's different, not necessarily different mics, but there's, there's, there's sort of, some people's voices are better suited to certain brands and certain types of mics than other people's voices. If you get where I'm going out with that one. I do. Um, that is the case. More often than not, it's not the most important thing mm -hmm. from what I've learned. Uh, the thing to look at there is the frequency pattern. Uh, I, I've talked probably way too much about the parametric equalizer earlier with all those frequency ranges I mentioned, the lower end being your zero to 60, then you got the muddy end from the 100 to 250, and then your mid range and your high frequency. Every microphone has a profile that, uh, that sits along that frequency range between zero and often 20,000, sometimes 18, and it will accentuate or de-accentuate certain areas of that curve to give you that sound. So what you're listening to now, which is a Shure MV7X, the XLR version, not the USB version, um, this one, if you looked at the frequency curve, would have probably a more neutral or prominent lower end because it tends to accentuate that. And you're probably hearing that in my voice now. You're like probably saying, uh, this guy sounds like he's broadcast ready because that's what the broadcaster voice is usually like. And that's what Shure microphones are great at. The Shure MV7, the SM7B, the SM58, they've all got, you know, a fairly <clears throat> deep and resonant microphone tone to them because of that frequency band. But then you'll sometimes have microphones that are a bit brighter. They have a, a high shelf on the higher end of the frequency range. Uh, I think the Lewitt pure 440 440 pure i think it is that one tends to be on the brighter end um the e100s stuff like that that really literally i'm just name dropping at this point i don't expect and you or anyone listening to understand what i'm <laughs> saying but those ones will recess the deeper voice and then uh 
accentuate the higher end. So if you have kind of a nasally voice, or if you tend to speak in quite a high frequency, getting a microphone that accentuates that might not be the best way to go. You might want to get something that has a bit of a deeper tone to it, a bit darker, they say. Um, but this is impossible to know unless you test the microphones as you do it, which in a time of COVID isn't necessarily something you can do anymore. Yeah. Being able to push your breath into things that a hundred other people have also pushed their breath into. Um, so doing the investigation, sometimes you do just have to test. Sometimes you have to land on a microphone and see how you can deal with it. If you have a good handle on an EQ, then you can offset these things. Like if you raise the higher end and lower the muddiness of the microphone I'm on now, then that's going to accentuate that higher end and make it a bit, you know, sparkle a little bit more. You'll get more of that higher frequency in it. Mm. Uh, that kind of manipulation generally, like the Blue Yeti would be bad for this. You'd look at the frequency curve and you'd, you'd EQ in theory to the point where you, it dials in perfect for your voice. But what you'll find more often is that it has artifacting in it. And you'll use the EQ to remove those bad port points in your audio. But with XLR microphones, it's a little bit more, I guess, thorough. Like yeah. it has a full spectrum. It records well. It's got a really, you know, that frequency band isn't affected by the digital signal that USB conversion does to it. So it's a little bit easier to EQ that stuff. But essentially, that's all it is. Like if you have a darker voice, get a brighter microphone. If you've got a brighter voice, get a darker microphone or whatever suits you really. Yeah. There's really no solid advice for how to approach that. I do wish there were like places we could go to where we could just test mics and hear them like sort of straight away. Uh, like like mm. I could go to a music shop and play a guitar. Um, I can't play a guitar. I'm tone deaf. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you could, but like, if you wanted to jump in and just strum a few strings, you'd be able to do it. Yeah, but I'd love for that to happen. If anyone is thinking of running a business, opening a business, there's a business idea. Do it. I will fund. I can't fund you. I'm scared. <laughs> well, I think some do. Um, at least in Australia, Billy Hyde Music, which I think is out of business now, or maybe they went into receivership and sold on to someone else. But. Uh, one of my friends who's a musician and actually works for Yamaha, he said that there are some places you can go where they have voiceover booths set up and you can just pick which mic you want to test and give it a go and see what you think. But I think it's not going to be like your Curry's PC world or yeah. something like that. It's going to have to be like a boutique shop or you know a music shop or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. That's so much fun to just nerd out. And I reckon we could probably do another two hours of nerding out just about, um, Definitely. just about tech, but I'm also aware that, uh, you have a life and <laughs> <laughs> you might want to go do that life at some point. Yeah. I'm a, so, a little bit late for work, but that's okay. A little bit. All right. You know, you know what? I, I'm a great excuse though. Like I am fantastic. Uh, just, just, just say yeah. Just listen to that podcast, and you'll find out why I'm late. Uh, you have to wait till January, but you'll find out. Yeah. Um. So before we go to our questionnaire that we end every episode with, uh, remind us of where we can find you on social media and and of your websites. Yes. So, uh, for the podcast editing services, if you are interested in outsourcing and paying for your podcast to be edited, which we haven't said on this podcast yet, but Invariably, it's every podcaster's not nightmare, but nobody likes to edit. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I do. <laughs> so get in touch with me at info at blistery.fm or go to blistery.fm and you'll be taken to the Dead Drop About Me page that includes a bit of information about me, how to get in touch. Uh, but the deaddrop.com, did I get that right? No, deaddroppod.com. Sorry, yeah. I had to be a bit creative with the domains that I picked. Um, if you head to deaddroppod.com, you'll find information about how to get to the podcast. Uh, you'll also see previous episodes 
and you'll see some episodes that I've guested on as well if you're interested in getting in touch with those podcasts too. Um, you can also email the show, deaddroppod at gmail.com. You can find me specifically on Twitter at Matt Bliss Pod. Uh, I should say as well, this being an opportunity to talk about it, is that if you're a podcaster and as you're listening to this, Twitter has burned in a fiery apocalypse, uh, you can seek out a podcasting discord called yeah. podcasting the podcasting community which is where yep. tom and i actually met uh and that is a great resource for people people sharing stuff their stories it's a much more relaxed way to do it than twitter uh i'm not entirely sure maybe we can put a link to the invite in the show notes i'll, I'll get that for you tom and that's yeah. how you can get access to it because that shouldn't change yeah uh where else can you find me that's probably it I mean, the dead yeah, drop is on Instagram as well. Um, yeah, there is an Instagram for it. I don't, I don't add as much content there as I would probably like, but it's a great way to stay informed when new episodes come out. So I'll mm -hmm. generally post when I release there as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the following questions close us out and they come from the Prost questionnaire. Uh, then later adapted by Bernard Pivot and then later by my hero, James Lipton. And now I present my Blue Yeti adaptation to you <laughs> i think you should give yourself more credit but also it's a great journey making questionnaire i don't know <laughs> gotta yeah, stay I, on I, brand <laughs> I, I i i mean james lipton stole it from bernard pivo bernard pivo stole it from prost prost probably took it from someone else it, it's just stolen all the way down it's it's like those it's like those articles we were talking about earlier on there's the one that leads back to another like like Bloomberg reported that Eurogamer reported that um, yeah. Bob reported. Uh, <laughs> all right. What is your favorite word? So my favorite word is actually meh. It's M-E-H, meh. Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason for that is that it's a, wife, uh, a word that my wife and I have co-opted to mean many and varying different things. like. Uh, this is one of those soppy couple stories that you hear and you're like, oh, that's dripping with romantic. I hate it. Uh, but we'll, you know, if we're in a bad mood, we'll be like, meh. And someone else will go, meh. And, you know, we kind of get the tone from the context. Um, but if we're happy, we'll also say meh to each other or, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's a very unusual one. I had a lot of trouble picking a word, being a walking vocabulary myself, but meh. That's the one that I probably use mm. quite a lot. Yeah, me and the other half, we've got grunts. We just go, Ugh. and oh, that's, that's all right. You can communicate so much through a grunt. Um, There's a lot to it. read into. A lot to read yeah, into. Exactly the tone and then the 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 in, in, the the, in, the what's the word I'm looking for? Intonation. I would say that's the one. That's the one. All right. What is your least favorite word? So I don't. I mean, I probably do. If it came up, it would be, I don't know what it would be, but I tend to find myself catching phrases that I don't like. And more often than not, they are filler phrases. Yeah. Things, excuse me, things that people have said that mean nothing and they add no value to a sentence, but they say them anyway, just because it's a thing that's said. Um, actually is probably a word. That does that like actually can be used in news sometimes as a bit of a baity thing uh if i'm being honest to which i always try to respond well make sure you're honest because if you're not then i wonder <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's the stuff like that 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 really tends to get my goat with language so yeah. while it's not specific you know listen to your own sentences and see if you say it yourself dear listener yeah. Uh, anything that you fill in that doesn't add any value. Yeah. That's what I don't like. Yeah. If you're being honest, what engages you? A true <laughs> radical honesty. <laughs> the thing that engages me is uh, passion and problem solving. Yeah. Something I've discovered about myself more recently. I, I will dedicate my attention to something that captures my passion that I get passionate about. And the other big component of me is the the problem-solving nature of things. You know, I like to see a, a challenge 
and try to solve the problem or address the challenge or you know complete a task whatever it is it doesn't seem to matter too much um mm -hmm. as long as it's a challenge yeah and i can be passionate about it that's the important thing to me mm -hmm. what disengages you uh again a more recent experience uh people people that are disingenuous or disrespectful about things not openly so but kind of belittling a little bit the the other bit that disengages me as part of that is when a corporation or a company or an organization does that with its employees i'm trying to be very non specific here mm -hmm. but if if i'm working in a workplace and i hear things going on up top that kind of means that they don't respect the work that people are doing, but they're trying to outwardly show that they do. It just, it, if you can see right through it, yeah. that just, I, I switch off completely. Yeah. yeah. Just totally. does not work for me. Mm -hmm. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, rain. I love listening to rain. Uh, Funnily enough, we're getting close to summer, so I've been getting a bit of rain in Australia. <laughs> I hope that sentence doesn't make sense because it's the weather here is unusual at the moment, but mm. we're getting an inordinate amount of rain at the moment. And I just, I love when it pops in and I can just sit back and listen to it. It's really mm. good. What sort of noise do you hate? See if you can guess. Is it a plosive? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess <Mouth> one. <laughs> plosives. <laughs> Anything, anything that, that ruins podcast listening for me or that I need to edit out that I hear in real life. Th those are the noises that I hate now. Mm. Um, I probably had a predilection to hating them recent, uh, like before I did podcasting, but that's just been amplified knowing that you can address it. Mm. Yeah, I'd say yeah. that's probably it. Everyone's favorite question, what is your favorite curse word? Now, I have listened to an episode, and you do permit them, uh, permit us to say the word. Yeah. I'm not going to say it, though, because I know how podcasting works. Works. I'm sure you use that explicit tag. This is the kind of word that makes people switch off stuff. So I'm not going to say it. It is the C word yeah. for anyone listening. Now, it's not for the shock value or the word itself. You may even know yourself that, that Australians tend to use this word perhaps a bit more than some other cultures would. But I have always enjoyed the nature around the word, that it's, it's kind of verboten without, without any kind of apology. Like no, I, I don't think there's many people that would say that it's an appropriate word that you can use in any context. But it's also very uh, alliterative. I don't think that's the word. But it's it's very staccato. It's very very short and sharp mm. as a word. So not only does it portray what it represents in the context and its meaning, but also the way that you say it. It's very mm. sharp. So it kind of does all those things incredibly well. Uh, don't say it yeah. <laughs> in real life as much <laughs> as you can. Pick your context, pick your, your, the people around you when you do drop that word, if there ever is an occasion to do it. But just from a purely you know, linguistic standpoint, I think it's a very interesting word. Yeah, it's like I know I can say that word around my siblings because we grew up together and we grew up in a household where that word was thrown around liberally but I cannot <laughs> say that word anywhere else <laughs> yeah it's uh, yeah it's a tough one yeah what profession other than your own would you like to attempt so again a more recent revelation for me I think and it's going to sound really bad but I would love to be a professional speaker or someone who, who has something of value to inspire people with. Yeah. Uh, someone of particular note is Simon Sinek that I've yeah. been looking into more recently. 
I haven't read any of his books yet, but I have seen a lot of his presentations and uh, the way that he is and uh, the way he presents, it, it's very similar to what I do with technology and the way that I try to train people in it. So if I had the opportunity to do something like that, but being able to research and be an expert in something that's you know, important to me and that I'm able to be an expert in. Like a lot of people say, I want to be in public speaking. Oh yeah, what would you speak about? What would you speak about? Stuff. Hmm. Like some people know that they like to talk in front of people, but not necessarily know what they want to say. I want to know I've got a message that I can, that I can send to people, you know, inspire people. Yeah. Um, and I can I can vouch for Simon Sinek because I've used one of his TED talks to write the first part of my CV that helped me get a job. So brilliant! Yeah, it's the one where he talks about what, why, and how you do something. The golden um, circle. Yeah, I, I love that. I just, I've I've been using it quite a lot recently. What profession would you not like to do? Chef. Why That's a very chef? easy one for me. I just I've always. I've never wanted to work with food, knowing that mm. if you do the wrong thing, it can kill people, <laughs> potentially. Um, but also the, the chef environment is very high pressure. Yeah. And it takes a long time to get to the chef role, which means you probably waded through a lot of uh, bad pay and potentially bad work conditions, and it takes a long time. Yeah, any, any, anything working with food, I have very low desire to do that yeah. yeah final question if you could say only one statement to any one person what would that statement be and who would that person be it, can we time travel yeah time travel anyone alive or dead what about uh uh universe ending paradoxes is that off limits too nope awesome okay so again, being revelatory to myself for the last few months, what I would love to say is to go back to myself in 10 to 15 years ago and just tell myself it's okay for things that you do to be about you, yeah, not about everyone else. Because if, if you're listening this far through the podcast, dear listener, you're getting a, uh, an incredibly big revelation for me that's very personal. But I've, I've discovered that through most of my career and with what I do personally, it's, it, as Simon would say, it's been in service. It's, yeah. it's giving to others and always making choices based on what is to the benefit of others and not necessarily myself. Whereas more recently, that's been a revelation. So I've, I've been trying to think about how I can pursue a working life, but also a personal life that, that prioritizes me, which sounds narcissistic. But, you know, 15 years younger Matt needs to know that he, he can make a decision that benefits him more so than everyone else. He, he needs to know that, I think. That's where the career ending, uh, the universe ending paradox comes in, because I wouldn't be in the position to say what I'm saying to myself now if I hadn't done the things that I did. But yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, though. I really do appreciate that honesty there and, and, and that candor. Ah, that's, I think that's, that's, a, that's a good note to end it on, um, because it is so tempting to be, to, to think, oh, this is, this is narcissistic, but then one of the best things that you can do is just look after yourself so that then you can look after someone else. Uh, That's it. We don't need it. Yeah. You got to put your own ox oxygen mask on first. Yeah. Remind me, where can I find you online? Uh, we've got Twitter at MapListPod, Instagram at DeadDropPodcast, DeadDropPod.com for the podcasts uh, that I make. Uh, blissery.fm if you're interested in me editing your podcast and discord somehow yeah. we'll figure it out i'm not on we'll mastodon we'll, we'll ask if we can put it in yeah <laughs> yeah 
And you can also find us on TikTok, which I never update to meet interesting people. Instagram, that I sometimes update at Tom underscore meets underscore interesting underscore people. Twitter, if that's still around, at Tom meets people. Um, but the best way you can sort of help us out on this podcast is going on to Good Pods and leaving us a review and helping us climb those charts because we are in the Indie Top 100 uh, documentary chart, which is an absolutely awesome place to be. And you can also, if you absolutely love this episode, you could read my reflection and my thoughts on this episode on my Substack, and you'll find that at tommeetsinterestingpeople.substack.com. Matthew, that's the longest recording session I've ever done. I apologize for that. <laughs> it no, te- always tends to be apologize. a long one. I've always got too much to say, and I tend to wobble. You, you maybe, if this still makes it into the episode, you'll probably hear me wandering in so many different directions, going on side quests, but always trying to reel it back to the original question somehow. That's something I've learned about myself too. 